So Beyond Crisis was kind of the kind of spur for our project um, and the title, um, thinking about how all of us became, as, as educators, at least, I know we probably have some other um, people in the room today, but as educators became sort of um, compelled into this modality or modalities hybrid and online due to the um, oh, sorry. crisis of the pandemic, that's okay. Um, so this is meant fully online classes, um, synchronous classes, asynchronous work. And so most commonly, and I think we experienced this among our colleagues and in our departmental conversations, and certainly at large in society, the conversations around this is uh, transitory, it's temporary, and people are waiting to get back to normal, with normal being something kind of elusive. And that's really kind of what we're trying to think about here is, um, what is constituting the norms? How does crisis uh, maintain certain norms? And how can we actually take this as an opportunity to really think through what makes for valuable, effective, and most importantly, inclusive and accessible teaching? And Alif and I, in our conversations, have determined that we think hybrid teaching um, should be the new normal because of what it really permits us to do in terms of inclusivity, in terms of accessibility, um, and that the real opportunity here is to move beyond a kind of crisis control mentality and to really think about, can we just change what we conceive as normal with this kind of teaching? So, and, and precisely because of the reason why we are we start thinking about what do we understand from accessible and inclusive. So um, accessibility in, in and we have I know in the room many instructional designers and people much more experienced than us, so they, it will be very familiar for those folks. But accessibility is originally understood as rooted in um, in in an understanding of um, abilities and disabilities. So. Um, it started originally in architecture, but then sort of expanded into education and often taught as uh, immediately equated with disability. However, we don't want to limit that term accessibility to the different abilities only. Um, what we have in mind when we are thinking about access is that we are using it um, as access points, having multiple forms multiple points of access in one's teaching. So we believe we should be opening as teachers, we should be opening as many spaces of access as possible so that people who are traditionally, historically uh, excluded from those spaces can actually enter to those spaces of learning. So we use inclusive accessibility as companion terms, not necessarily equal terms, but definitely companion terms. So this accessibility can manifest itself in many levels. It can manifest itself in technological levels, what kind of technologies we are using, um, economical levels. For instance, probably for most of us, uh, pandemic has shown that our students are coming to classrooms from different places based on their economical levels, um, curriculum design, uh, pedagogical access, or racial access, and etc. So, for we are using inclusive accessibility, and we are thinking hybrid teaching are actually opening more doors than merely in-person teaching. Great, and just sort of building on that, when we're using this idea of hybrid teaching, um, it really is for us kind of calling attention to creating uh, a wonderful opportunity for really thinking about from a design, design place, especially different points of access. Um, thinking about uh, students' abilities, learning forms, social location and educational experience, and really uh, being interested in all kinds of ways and promoting those differences and promoting accessibility that reflect um, the true diversity of our classrooms. So for example, um, in my experience, especially last two years, while I started teaching hybrid and or synchronous or synchronous classes, um, and we are actually practicing that right now, slides and subtitles are often um, create a different learning environment and include more students who otherwise had difficulties accessing. What do I mean by this? For example, I'm a person with an accent. So um, actually using, using um, PowerPoint and slides and lectures with subtitles help many of my students understand me better. 
And in addition, for those students who work, who don't have time to, let's say, catch all of my lectures or pay attention to me in the class because they are perhaps uh, overworked and tired the next day, I can always record, record my classes and for later access. So I am giving more than one way for them to access to the knowledge, to see what I'm teaching, to hear and read and visually engage at the same time. And the same goes true for office hours, for example. Um, it, it, when we were doing in-person classes, um, the students had to come to my office, yeah? And those hours are pretty much limited. So many of my students do work. Um, so now with hybrid teaching, those students who didn't have access to my office hours now do have access because I can meet them at 9 p.m. over Zoom, which I wasn't able to do when we were doing in-person classes. Great. Um, and I think, too, Alif and I both work in, a, as we said, the writing program primarily. And so we're doing reading intensive, writing intensive, discussion based classes. Um, and thinking about different kinds of access for when we're on a synchronous day, an asynchronous day, or an in-person day um, has allowed us to really think about uh, all the different ways we can engage students in written and spoken opportunities to really think about the full sense of our time when we're together, um, to think about how uh, a student might be invited to participate in the chat versus with their voice um, in a small group, in a large group, uh, over time, a, uh, when offline, so thinking about how we can really engage with those sort of core skills that we're, we're here to work on with students in terms of uh, reading and writing and presenting um, in all kinds of different ways. Hybrid has really enabled a lot of creativity in that regard. And while the creativity is there to sort of um, continue with that, what we want to underline today is how we design those hybrid forms to give us more access points. One thing that we have in mind is and for those of you in the room who are already the experienced teacher, you know this, teaching needs to determine the technology. In other words, um, our medium is teaching and we want to design our hybrid synchronous and asynchronous courses um, with thoughtful and inclusive designs rather than exciting designs. So hypothesis is a great tool, but I wouldn't use it just because it's a great tool. Play posit is an excellent thing to play with, actually, but I wouldn't use it if it doesn't create good access points. Yeah. So, um, and earlier today, uh, Pauline and Eliza talk about design justice, and I think I would resonate their idea here that teaching should determine the technology, thoughtful teaching rather than excited teaching. And we're going to give you some examples today. And at any point, by the way, if anybody has a question or a comment, you can use chat and you can also um, raise your hand and then um, so, sort of ask us a question. I am curious right now, are there any questions um, that you would like to ask us or um, are we doing okay? How are we doing? I think we're pretty good in the chat. We've got a conversation going um, about sort of how students are maybe other students or newer students to our classrooms are found given that we have more access with the technology, which I think is an interesting way to think about that, to really think on even a, another scale of access and sort of inviting um, other students into to learning and into these courses. Okay. So we will begin um, with a synchronous thought. So um, Jenny is going to talk more about asynchronous elements and I'm going to sort of talk about synchronous hybrid classes. So a um, couple of notes when I when when we do these synchronous classes. So um, when I ha when I say synchronous hybrid, I mean one class session is on synchronous over Zoom, another class in person. So when we do design those classes, we have to create a good balance between what we're going to do in the synchronous classes and what are we going to do in the in-person classes. For those of you who teach, this is already like common knowledge. However, um, here are some points that we take into consideration when we do design synchronous um, hybrids. So um, on the left hand side, you are seeing a table. And this table sort of gives the basic motivation, basic raison d'etre of um, uh, designing synchronously. So I always have an exercise immediately before the Zoom class. And that exercise is meant to 
initiate an encounter with the knowledge that we're going to unpack, we're going to think about in the class. During the Zoom class, I like to concentrate on digesting and unpacking that knowledge. And in the in-person, I am aiding, aiming at metacognition, how they can evaluate that knowledge, how they can add to that knowledge. So because I have those pedagogical concerns, what I would recommend in designing these access points is A, think about what are some advantages of the Zoom. Um, Definitely PowerPoint is an advantage in the Zoom. PowerPoint will give us, or PowerPoint Google points the slides, will give us access, the visual access to what you are saying, as well as the subtitles. Therefore, if I am doing any lectures, any explications, I usually put them in Zoom classes, and I don't do more than 20 minutes um, because visuality is there. Now, when I do the lectures, uh, I want to make sure that there is some visual images, there is some um, uh, explication of the terms that they can follow. And if I am actually showing a PPTS, a PowerPoint, I uh, usually just like I did now, I sort of read it through and show where they should be looking at, rather than just like assuming that they know how to read slides. In addition, in the Zoom classes, as we're going to practice today, I don't do too much breakout groups. Instead, I take the advantage of working as a class, and I call it commons, create a common knowledge, create a common digesting, which we're going to practice today all together. As opposed to this, in in-person classes, and especially if I'm working with able bodies, I would like that sessions to be more practical activities that add to the knowledge that is already unpacked, that is already talked about in the Zoom classes. So students are always encouraged to walk, to do group work. A lot of activities are actually left in this model to um, in-person classes. Great. And then um, thinking through asynchronous. Um, so typically that is for the classes I've been teaching an in-person day and then an asynchronous day that gets designated for the week. Um, and the way that I have gone through kind of considering, okay, well, what am I gonna do on an in-person meeting and what am I gonna do for the asynchronous week? Um, and thinking through on the scale of a unit or a week, um, I kind of have these series of questions that I go through for, for thinking through design. Um, which do kind of in their own way map onto this kind of um, three step of encounter, digest, and add um, to the knowledge that's being built in the classroom. So the first question I think of is um, what activities are better suited for kind of autonomous work? Um, and as I said, in a, in a writing classroom, um, having an explicit assignment that is around pre-writing can be really invaluable to the to students process with their with their writing and with their learning. Um, and that makes a great asynchronous activity because it is more autonomous. And so it's structured uh, and sort of fits into connecting with discussions we've been doing or um, leading up to milestone assignments, um, but does encourage that sort of asynchronous when you can carve your own time to work autonomously. Um, another version of asynchronous, this question I ask is what activities are better suited for extended en engagement? So this is not simply a student working on their own, but working in a pair or a group, but, and maybe the whole class or the whole commons, but when it might be um, advantageous to think through doing this over time, having students return to a conversation, um, build on pieces that other people are contributing. Um, and I think, we think, Elif and I were just talking about how the sort of go-to discussion board assignment sort of has to happen over time. Um, Google Docs um, is another way that I know both of us have used it. Um, and the a sample assignment we'll look at today even asks students to sort of self-organize that time and that engagement, but it has to happen over time and maybe um, have a few different interaction points. Um, the last way I think about this is what activities can be modified um, to really actually take advantage of the asynchronous to promote inquiry, self-reflexivity, and self-directed learning. Um, and this is, you know, I think of this in two ways. Two examples would be kind of discovery tasks where I know Alif and I both have done this, where we teach research at times where then the asynchronous activity is um, 
again, structured, but allows students to go and find a source that connects to something, um, to do some research through Wikipedia and then report on their experience that connects that to something we're learning in the classroom. Um, and that really kind of encourages that self-directed learning um, skills that they are encountering and having to understand for themselves. Um, and another way I've done this is this activity I'll show you an example of called Review and Respond that actually asks students to engage with the course material and how it's been set up and written um, and make smaller goals for themselves and also sort of interact and question really what it is we're doing all together in the class and kind of how it comes down from the teacher sometimes. The kind of counterpoint question to all of this that I think is important to ask is um, kind of on the flip side, when is uh, embodied togetherness is kind of how I'm thinking about in-person advantageous. So for example, we're looking at a text today um, by Ashil Membe that is on decolonizing the university. And, that might be a challenging text to some where actually being in person together and encountering it <clears throat> with each other might actually be better suited to some time when we're all gathered together and we can kind of sit through the difficulty. Um, so that's a question I always have is um, when might actually showing up together be better suited, even if I could easily do that discussion asynchronously. Um, so this slide shows you that review and respond uh, assignment, which I started at when we sort of did the pandemic transition, um, but I've actually really incorporated as essential to my courses. And I think I'll continue even when we go back to an in-person modality, but this is just an opportunity with that I have students for every milestone assignment to engage with that assignment and break it down, but on their own, you know, I used to spend time in class where we would review the assignment sheet and talk about it on the spot and ask questions. But I started doing it this way where students are engaging with the assignment um, on their own and sort of in a more reflective mode. And so I have them sort of at the top, I connected into where are we in the course? How are they gonna build on uh, things they've already been doing? And then looking forward to, okay, when is this assignment due? How can you start to plan for it? Um, and the questions below, um, the first four are always kind of the same. So students get in the habit of kind of going through this process with their assignments. And then the last one I change out. The first two, um, as you understand it, what do you need to do for this assignment? And what are the main goals of the assignment? Are really kind of a comprehension, but also a moment to synthesize and sort of have students um, really think through the assignment in their perspective and in their lives. Um, it also gives me a sort of agreement. I'm gonna give them that information, right? I need to tell you what you need to do and what the goals are. Um, so that becomes a transparent moment between us in the context of the class. The third bullet, um, what questions do you have? Where do you want more explanation or clarification? That's always super insightful to me in terms of how I think I've written the assignment and made things clear and where it hasn't become clear or where we went through something too quickly in the class and we need to revisit it. Um, so it gives students that opportunity to immediately interact with the assignment and with me. Um, it gives us a way to think about the next workshop or the next in-person meeting we're going to have. Sometimes I address the questions directly to students in the feedback on Canvas. Sometimes I make a separate document. I gather everyone's questions and I answer them like an FAQ sheet. And sometimes we'll bring it, like I said, to the next class meeting and just discuss them all together. So it really gives students a chance to set the uh, kind of tone for how we're gonna work on this assignment and what needs to happen. The last one in this case is setting a goal and really is another moment for that autonomy where students are thinking through their own learning, it's metacognition, what are, you know, where have you been? Where are you going? Where do you wanna go? Um, and how this assignment might fit in with that. And so if students are often tempted to set a goal of a grade, I encourage them explicitly to break that down, to think through what's something they know they need to work on to get there, um, which gives me a, a lot of insight in terms of how I can direct feedback or design a workshop. And the last part of this question is, what kind of support do you want from the course, from me as the instructor, from assignments, from peers, et cetera, um, to help you work toward that goal? And that really also sets the tone of, this is an independent assignment. This is 
autonomous sort of asynchronous work on your own, but it's still very much plugged into what we're doing as a class um, and how we're all working together in a kind of workshop mode um, and how we can work on this together. Any questions at this point about the kinds of design considerations we've been discussing or that specific assignment that we can go over? We're gonna then turn to kind of some interactive practice assignments. Uh, Jenny, Marlene is asking, this is a very interesting approach and one I will adopt. Do you utilize this approach for all assignments or only the major ones? And that's a very good question. Do you wanna answer that? I think um, that is a good question. Uh, when there's a kind of extended engagement with it, I have done this. So that's writing assignments in our classes, the sort of milestones, or we have a presentation assignment coming up. Um, the kind of the way I judge it is if I have to write a lot of directions, I want to check that it, those directions make sense to the students, right? Um, and it's always a, a moment of opportunity to revise anything or jump in and clarify, or maybe we collectively want to change the direction of something. So I would typically do it for what I think of as milestone assignments, but a maybe more practical ways thinking, how much direction am I giving on this? One more question, and then we can quickly answer that and move forward with the synchronous. Given the scaffolding is done a week before the assignment is due, how much time is there to assess and respond? How do you do the timeline is the question. Right, so um, I, yeah, and I think there was another one before that, um, the students responded individually. You can choose the methods, right. Yeah, so I have students do this individually and, um, you know, if it's due on, like I have a Tuesday, Thursday meeting schedule and they do it on the Thursday asynchronous day, I try and get through it, you know, prioritize responding to it um, very quickly so that I can create that FAQ sheet um, or get back to a student individually. So there is time to respond. Um, and right, and with that interest, John, to sort of giving myself a chance to respond to them, but also students to respond back to me. Um, the way I've done, Belief and I have done these writing program classes, we do have a workshop usually built in before a draft is due. And so that workshop is an opportunity to take a lot of the information from the review and respond into a workshop before the draft is due. Um, is typically how I, I have found it works best. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to move and then there will be hopefully some time with the questions. Worst case scenario, we'll stay in Zoom and you can ask us any question that you have, even if we don't um, do it. So if you were to do some asynchronous sort of jumping off from Jenny's, um, one thing that Jenny's review and response underlines, and I think that's beautiful as a teacher, is the self-reflexivity and then getting the input from the students to design your course. So when I do the synchronous courses, I approach the same way. So um, this is how I go through a specific topic. So before the synchronous class, I have usually an asynchronous um, exercise where I actually ask students what, what, where do they encounter an obstacle? Where do they encounter a clarification and what they find interesting? And I'm gonna show it to you in a moment. During the Zoom session, I design my lectures or class based on the previous feedback that I get from the students, just like Jenny does with the FAQ. And, um, and then during in-class in the Zoom session, I do a common um, thematic reading, which we're gonna do together today. Um, between the uh, synchronous class and in-person class, I usually give some autonomy to students to prepare for the class. And sometimes instructional designers call it like a flip the classroom. So in in-person classes are when I do most of the group work and let the students build on the knowledge that we unpack together during the Zoom sessions. So for today, what we're gonna do, Jenny and I together, we're gonna do an exercise as if you are our students, as if we are teaching this topic called decolonizing academia. So um, this is a hypothesis exercise that I would have given to my students before the Zoom session. So um, in this, I am using the technology called hypothesis. And in hypothesis, you can have a text and actually annotate a text. So uh, this is a very typical hypothesis exercise that I do. So here I say, please read Ashil Mambe's Decolonizing the University New Directions with a view to notice his argument. Please highlight and annotate two moments. First moment, one place or passage where you think this text would benefit from clarification and expansion. Please tell us what do you think 
is unclear in the text. And a second moment where they think is important. So one section passage or sentence that you think is important for us to unpack in the class. So the reason why I ask those two questions is A, because I want to prepare my lectures or classes based on where students feel are most interesting and most difficult. And B, when students are reading a text, I want them to practice that not every text that they're going to read are going to be completely understandable, that they're going to be obstacles in the text, and they're going to not understand every part of the text, but still they can find the text interesting. So for every text, there will be a passage where there's going to be something extremely difficult, another place where there's going to be something that's interesting. So when they do it, it's going to look like this. Hold on, hypothesis, yes. So this is hypothesis. So you upload actually the text here. And then they can actually pick, they can underline a moment passage. And once they underline, they can actually annotate and tell me where they find it difficult and where they find it interesting. So for instance, th these are all me as students, but here, um, I picked this one because there is the word hegemonic that is in it that can be difficult for students. So the student may say, this needs clarification. So I'll make sure I'll arrange my class around this concept. Or another student may say, I find this very interesting. His knowledge is becoming commodity. So I want, I want to make sure that we unpack that. So I'll make sure that I actually um, arrange my lecture around the input before I um, actually go and then do the Zoom class. So um, once I received that feedback, then I would basically do a 20 minutes, um, at most 20 minute kind of lecture going over those unpacking po points in class. And I would do it very interactively. I will say something like, oh, Jenny, you have picked this and you, you thought this was an obstacle for you. Do you want to talk about it? What was difficult? And most often than not, students converge. They find the same places, similar places difficult, similar places interesting. So um, it actually creates a common where we, we are actually working on the text together. Yeah. Um, so let's say I did the lecture in class. Then we I would probably do this exercise. So I'm going to copy and paste this Google document. Um, address to chat so I got it will, keep going you got it okay perfect so i will invite everyone to come to this google doc and that you must all have access to this so this is a document this is an excerpt from ashen members decolonizing the university in new directions so what jenny and would, uh, i would like us you to do is to give a quick read to this it's a very short excerpt but it's um, interesting we will say so um, once you read it, just read it on your own. And I, we would like you to highlight a passage or a sentence that is relevant to you. And um, on that highlights, you can pay attention to language. You can perhaps find some connections that is relevant to you, to your teaching, to your reading. Um, and basically tell us, uh, comment on it, comment on your highlights. Sorry, that's too many web pages at the same time. Um, so let me show you an example. So you're going to basically click this, highlight it, and then add a comment and say, I find this interesting, or I think this is what's happening, or this is basically an act of unpacking. Yeah. So once you did that, uh, we're going to give you five minutes. And once you did that, after about five minutes, we're going to ask a volunteer to go over some of the highlights and we're going to talk about the text. So this is something we will do in a synchronous class as an exercise in common. So we're going to give you five minutes to actually do that. OK, so. And just to as you're going through, just to sort of highlight, you know, another way of thinking about access in this case would be the kinds of annotations you might make. We're all different readers paying attention in different ways. So someone might pay attention to language, a single word or a phrase. Um, someone might pay attention to a whole big idea, right? And pay attention, okay, what is this idea doing in the passage? You might pose a question if you're feeling um, more uh, maybe distant from just sort of pulled into the idea. You want to pose a question, you're skeptical, you want to build something further. 
a connection you can make, something you've already been thinking about or already know coming into this text. Um, and it also is totally okay just to write a reaction and reflect on why did you react that way in the text as you were going along. Um, so all of those would be different ways you might engage and interact with the text here. And then we'll put it all together and see indeed how many different ways did, did the class, um, our class uh, access the, the reading here. So we were wondering if someone felt they would um, be willing to volunteer to unmic, um, unmute rather, use your mic, um, and just kind of take us through the annotations and give us a different version of the text through the comments of the annotation. So just read really what people are leaving on the margin there. Yeah, it's very simple. Just anybody who would like to read the annotations will be great. Not us, but somebody who is who is willing to throw themselves to the fire. You can just unmute yourself. Yeah, Lynn, you volunteered. Thank you for that. Okay. Sure. Can I put the camera on? I'm sitting in the kitchen. <laughs> sure. How's everyone doing today? I'm happy to read them. They're fascinating here, and the people are yeah. resonating with a lot of my sentiments. Should I start at the top? Yes. Start at the top and take us through. Okay, so Elizabeth started us off. I found this articulation of the goals of inclusive teaching to be very powerful. Next, Jenny writes, I appreciate that this verb is used right away to give a definition of where we might end up with decolonizing. What would happen if we measured assessed for this instead? An anonymous writer provided, what does it mean by, quote, free pursuit of knowledge, unquote? How does it look like? What is the underlying benefit? Next, Paula asserts, I know rigor is important and we all have accreditation bodies to answer to. Sometimes I see a course filled with so much content to assure that the content hours are met, yet they create an overload for the student and may not be directly related to the activities. Jennifer writes, I wonder if this may be attributed to industrialization. Is higher education bureaucratic because we need to produce a certain kind of worker? Next, Anonymous offers, why is this surprising? Anonymous furthers the comment with, this doesn't really resonate for me, but feels backwards. Anonymous also said, this is so true in nursing. It's highlighted there to the left. Next, Rachel also asserts this resonates. I feel like the university's obsession with assessment eclipses the institution's interest in actual teaching. Anonymous also then offered, I because it's easier and fairly mindless, it's always quantitative assessment. So how much do we do something is much more important than how well or even why we do it. Jennifer also asked, does all of this actually result in better learning? Paul comments, Decolonizing is not a term I have used, Paula, excuse me. Decolonizing is not a term I have heard used in this way, would like to learn more about this concept. Elizabeth also indicates the idea of replacing student or learner with client removes the place of education to service. Kagadate and Ray Dogan wrote, business model mentality dominates all facets of educational institutions. It over, it, excuse me, it overpowers the real purpose of production of knowledge and public good. Marlene then counters debatable with the rising cost of education, students need to ensure that they will be able to have a good standard of living and even pay student loans afterwards. Jonathan queries, does this suggest that the university discourse and branding of being student-centered is part of colonial logic neoliberal branding and audit culture. And finally, my own comment, customer service is now the goal of higher education. Students are consumers of services provided by faculty and staff. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'll mute now. Thank you Thank so you. much, Lynn. Thank you so much for reading. We have so little time, so we need to speed up a little <laughs> bit. But however, this is what we would have done this class and this is what I mean by comments. So instead of breaking people into groups, breakout groups, we have a common text and we are sort of as a common building the text together. So we would have, this is a form of access point, especially for those students who are shy. After seeing those comments, we are asking volunteers to read loud. So someone's voice is heard, but that person is also embodying all the voices in the classroom.
So if I'm shy, if I don't want to speak, if I don't like to chat, I can just comment and Lynn will be my voice. And the teacher can actually negotiate those space. So if, if this was a real classroom, we will go over those comments and discuss it together. And then what we would have done is the next thing, and which I'm going to share with you, and we're going to do it very, very quickly. We would have asked students to write down on chats their teams that they see emerging in those annotations. So for example, if we look at this thing right now, we are seeing that this um, there is this there is a lot of discussion around this around this understanding of the student as the consumer. So probably that would have been a team. There are a lot of discussions around like this um, first part. Yeah. So there we would have picked some keywords from here and that would have been a theme. So what we would have done and we were hoping to do in this session is to divide you then into thematic groups. And uh, Jenny, do you want to very quickly walk what would you, we would have done anonym, um, asynchronously after this Great. exercise? Yeah. So um, well, we exactly have a little time. Go, 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 go. <laughs> the lightning version of this. We, as we were just working in the common as a whole group, then we would take mm, last maybe eight minutes of class based on the themes. Where do you want to keep working in a group setting um, and breaking into breakout rooms really as a function of get to know you really quickly. Think about how you would want to work together, because then from there in maybe an asynchronous format or if self-organized, you wanted to do it synchronously, you would be working in a group to take that theme and prepare a presentation, which would then take us into the next class meeting, which would be potentially in-person, potentially synchronous. But again, it's this, um, you know, I, I did this on a Thursday, they're coming or on a Wednesday and they come back a week later. They have a whole week to work on a group presentation. I encourage students to self-organize. I'm there as a mediator should issues arise, but students can meet together. They can divide up the work equitably and work asynchronously. And that sort of adds the layering to the analysis, taking us further into discussion and then eventually into some writing. Yes, and if it was an asynchronous, what I would have done with this is take the themes, divide the students into groups and in the in-person session, I will ask them to do quick research, especially let's say there was a group on decolonization. That group will do a before the class research on decolonization, have a presentation using Mambe text and decolonization and add, do a metacognition in the class. So the in-class discussion would have been just like Jenny's asynchronous um, assessment. There will be another way they are accessing this text and this knowledge by actually adding to it as a group. Um, so we had this two, I'm going to first go the key recommendations and then we're going to ask you, I think that would be better. So the key recommendations that we have because we are out of time, Jenny. Have multiple access points to content and objectives. And we argue that hybrid model does that. And we mean that access in all kinds of ways, like we were saying, learning styles, um, time, economics, personality, whatever it is, create access. Second, give students space to grow and be themselves. Cultivate autonomy in this process rather than standardization. Uh, think about the reflection exercise that Jenny has um, exemplified that model. Autonomy, the feedback from students is everything. And they, we should assume that our students know what they need, that they will be self-reflexive in this uh, moment rather than trying to control their every move. And building on that, exactly right we need to know who's in the room. And inclusive, te inclusive teaching means starting there and learning from participants or students about what we need to accomplish together. What hybrid teaching is giving us is multiple forms of engagement, like subtitles, PowerPoints, videos. You do not use them because they are shiny, but use them because you want to create access points. And finally, hybrid teaching opens up different ways of teaching that are not always perceived as traditionally successful. Um, so I would say instead, bring students in on that evaluation. How is it going? Do they feel like this is working for them? Do they prefer a different kind of activity? Again, using those checkpoints where you can to just constantly revise, which is again, building that access. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for listening to us. We wish we had more time to do more exercises with you, uh, but we are here in case you have any questions. Thank you all.